I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories, bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? The Chris Johnston Show. Powered by Sports Interaction. Wanna bet? What is going on? Here's Chris with your host, Julian McKenzie. Part of the game. Friend of the show, Sid Sixero, is going to love this segment. It's time for Leafs Corner. It's the show, it's the part of the show where we lean very much into talking about the Toronto Maple Leafs. CJ, we have to talk about the Leafs because they did a lot of things this past weekend when it came to free agent frenzy. Uh, Max Domi is a member of the Toronto Maple Leafs. I believe you got that first. Uh, Ryan Reeves, a member of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Tyler Bertuzzi, a member of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Earlier this morning, Dylan Gambrell named to the Toronto Maple Leafs as well. They got a lot of pieces What's what's what? What do you think of the free agent spending so far? Well, it's been an interesting period, right? I mean, a lot of consternation, I think, in the the first day of free agency in these parts where you know the Leafs saw a lot of their their players from last season head elsewhere, and you know didn't have a whole lot to show back other than signing John Klingberg to a one year deal. Didn't even uh, mention fill, him yet to fill a hole on their blue line, you know, give them a little more offense back there. And then obviously the Reeves signing, I think day two was much kinder uh, to Brad true living and, and company. And, and, you know, frankly, I, I like the deals for both the players and the clubs that, that, that get to uh, get that done here. Right. I mean, Tyler Bertuzzi went into free agency, Julian, he was looking for a six year deal at something like $6 million. Maybe he would have done a seven year deal at five and a half million. Uh, and pretty quickly the market uh, went away from where those options weren't there for him at least with the kind of teams that I think he was looking to play for. And so faced with that decision, what do you do? I mean, I think pivoting to a one-year contract at five and a half million uh, with the Leafs makes a lot of sense for a player like this. I mean, it sets him up in an opportunity where he's probably going to play, I think, safe to assume on one of Toronto's top two lines with good offensive players, put up a big season and then potentially give it another kick next year when we're going to have a cap that goes up by 5%. You know, Max Domi's in a similar spot. He was looking for, a little bit of security, I think. He's you know bounced around a fair bit the last number of seasons between teams, um, but when once the once the dance started, I mean, there's there's not enough seats for everyone, right? It's a little bit like musical chairs, and so he gets a one year deal at three million, and I think is in a very similar position to Bertuzzi in that, look, he gets to you know get a little bit more exposure playing in Toronto. Um, you know, for him, it's it's a homecoming. He tweeted a picture with you know him and his dad Ty, a longtime Maple Leafs player, where he was in the in the locker with Ty and, you know, saying he's coming home. And, and, you know, I think he puts himself in a spot where if he has a big year and plays on Hockey Night in Canada every Saturday, you know, he's likely to be in, uh, find himself in some pretty big demand come the summer of 2024. Okay. So for people who might not understand, uh, not just with the Leafs, but a whole bunch of other players around the league signing a lot of one-year deals, if you can, for the people who might not understand, why are we seeing more of that this off season? Well, I mean, we're basically in year five or six of the cap barely going up, right? It's only going up by a million on the ceiling. You know, that means it's only 32 extra million dollars in the whole league to spend on salaries next year. And and obviously there's a lot of free agents and some of those free agents takes up a bigger piece of the pie. You know, someone from Alex Kalorn, for example, was was making a contract for years in Tampa in the fours. Well, he gets a, a contract at 6.25 million uh, in, in Anaheim. I mean, that he's taken a piece of the pie there. It's it's less money all around. I'm not not just singling Kalorn out, but, you know, players get raises and then there's not enough money elsewhere. I think where there's excitement now for players is, is the cap beyond next season is expected to go up above 87 million. The year beyond that expected to get up around 92 million. And so we're finally looking at a phase once we get through the 2023, 24 season where it's really going to move. And so I think it's going to be, you know, reasonable to think it's a better to be a free agent in those summers. And so whether it's Matt Duchesne taking a one-year deal in Dallas to, to put himself in kind of the Bertuzzi Domi situation, you know, even Dimitri Orlov took a two year contract with, with Carolina North of $7 million a season, but you know, he was the, the biggest name and, and best defenseman on this free agent class. I mean, I think that that shows, and you know, we saw Gavrikov do it when he signed his extension in LA. I mean, there's, we could go around the league. There's a lot of players that are wanting to be free agents in 2024 or 2025, because I think they just believe that, that we're going to see a shift up in, in all player salaries over that time. And so, you know, I think that these, the, the Domi Bertuzzi deals work for those players for that reason, I think. And, and, you know, from the Leafs end of it, you're getting two 28 year old forwards uh, who I think can produce offense at a rate you feel comfortable at. Cause remember the Leafs have lost Michael Bunting and Alex Kerfoot among others, uh, you know, signing elsewhere, but th those were 
pretty you know important members of the Leafs' top nine uh, forward group the last couple of seasons. So you, you can plug these guys in those holes. You know they're going to be motivated. They're on one-year contracts. They, they're actually coming in at, at market value or maybe a little below. And, you know, I think they bring a different element too. I mean, Bertuzzi in particular, very rambunctious player, aggressive player, high energy player. Uh, you know, Max Domi, well, I don't see him in quite the same vein. You know, he's, he played center last year, Julian. He'd been a left winger most of his career. And so there's a little versatility there if the Leafs run into injury trouble or want to try some different things. And so I, I think it's a, a nice, happy union all around. And I'll say this, if the Leafs didn't sign one or both of those guys, what would be left on the market for them? I mean, I, I think that that's, that's where you got to feel good if you're in Brad True Living's office to, you know, today is that there wasn't a lot out else, elsewhere if you couldn't get those deals done. And so I think you'll, you'll feel a sigh of relief for the Leafs front office. Now they have to do work, man. They're over the salary cap at this moment. That they are. Um, and so I think you're going to see the end of Matt Murray one way or another in Toronto. Obviously, they're going to explore the trade avenues with him first. Um, because it would be preferable to get his entire cap hit off, you know, roughly 4.7 million off the books. If not, they might get a second buyout window uh, following salary arbitration later this month or into August. And so, you know, maybe they, they look at a, a buyout of, of Murray's contract. But I think what these signings tell us is there's no world that Matt Murray's back with the lease next year. It's just now a matter of how they get to his contract off the books. So that's one way of looking at things with regards to their cap space. Uh, one other name that's being looked at a lot with the Toronto Maple Leafs is William Nylander. Uh, what can we say about his status in terms of getting an extension? Well, it's not going well. I think that that's fair to say. There was a lot of um, discussions down at, at the draft in Nashville between the team and his agent. And they just see the world differently at this point in time. You know, William Nylander believes he should be a $10 million player or a little bit above that on his next contract. And, you know, he has a reasonable argument, I think, based on the points he's had, but I, I just don't see how the Leafs can ever make that work. And so ultimately, you know, as they work through this a little further, I think that there's going to have to be a decision on Nylander's end about how badly he wants to be a Leaf, how much less than that number he might be able to take. Uh, because I would be stunned if we saw Toronto, you know, sign him to a contract that takes him into that realm. You know, I think the Leafs have, have come at him with a number in the eights. Um, and that's kind of where where things are at. Um, you know, sometimes negotiations are rocky though. You know, I, I'm not going to predict where this is headed yet. I still think that the Leafs are willing to take some time to try to work through things with Nylander's camp. Um, certainly value the player, but they've got to be mindful of their own books too. And so, you know, this contract doesn't kick in until next summer. So in some ways that's good for, for Toronto because, you know, there is going to be that cap bump uh, league wide going up, but, you know, I think for Nylander, the big worry is he doesn't want to be paid so much less than Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner. He just feels internally that, that you know, that he has a sense of what should be fair there. And, and the team is looking at the marketplace. I mean, you, you get Pierre-Luc Dubois signing eight and a half million dollar deal. Timo Meyer on an eight-year contract in L.A. Timo Meyer got eight point eight million in Santa or sorry, in New Jersey, rather, um, on an eight-year deal. But, you know, those are different types of players. Those guys are six foot three. You know, Dubois plays center. Um, you know, there's no denying Nylander's skill and, and the fact he's actually been a Leaf that's been productive in the playoffs, had a 40 goal year last year, more than 80 points. Um, let's see if they can find a, a happy medium in there. But my sense right now is there's a bit of a strain in negotiations with the way things have gone. I think that, um, you know, clearly the Leafs have a, a number in mind for Nylander and he's asking for a lot more than, than what they're comfortable paying. Uh, even though you mentioned those comparables uh, with Pierre-Luc Dubois as an example, even if they might be different players, and you mentioned the salaries attached to them, is it fair to say that maybe the Leafs would rather sign William Nylander to that $8 million or $8.5 million? Oh, I would think so. I mean, and, and look, this is the negotiation. Maybe maybe the, the good point to get it done lands at $9 million and it's sort of both sides stretched a little in the direction they didn't want to go to get it done. I mean, um these these sorts of things, you know, this is this is how this can go. But I, th I think with Nylander, the Leafs are going to have to at some point make a decision. If if there really is no movement and and they feel like it's a logjam, there's got to be a decision about trading them, right? And um, you know, I, I don't know what the trade market is out there for them. I think there's risk here. Let's let's call this as it is. Like I get that Nylander thinks he's worth, you know. 10 million, 10 and a half million on an eight year deal. Well, first of all, if he goes to free agency next year as a 
UFA, you know, he can only sign a seven year contract with another team. And so, you know, if the Leafs offer something like eight times eight, that's 64 million, you know, on a seven year deal, even to get 64 million, he's going to have to get like nine and a half. Right. And so th- there is risk on the players end here. If this doesn't go well, um, you know, he does have a 10 team, no trade clause, Julian, that kicked in on July 1st. I know that his side is, has, you know, filled that out essentially and, and filed it to the Leafs. And so, you know, I think that there will be a point here if a deal doesn't get done that we'll start talking more about a trade. I don't think that that's a priority for the Leafs. They've obviously gauged the market on him, um, but they'd still like, they'd still like Nylanders to stay in Toronto. It's just, you know, the player is going to have to work with them a little bit, I think, to make it happen. And if he, if he draws a line in the sand and he says it's not going under 10 million, then I think he's going to leave them with, well, I guess there's a choice that the choice is keep them for one more season and let them walk away for nothing potentially or, or see if there's a trade that makes sense for them uh, before that happens. Is there anything else you want to mention about Nylander before I get to the other Toronto Maple Leafs player who's in need of an extension? What's his name again? Austin Easton. I drafted <laughs> in Easton last week. Austin Matthews is obviously the player I'm talking about, Siege. Did you see the picture of Easton? Easton Cowan was the Leafs' first-round pick, and there was a picture of him as a kid kind of touching the glass and looking at Mitch Marner. It's like, That was really God. cute. It was a great, cute photo, but it's also just like, we are so old. <laughs> like, he was like a little <laughs> kid. Like, it's just like, he grew up looking up to Mitch Marner. Like, Mitch Marner, in my eyes, of course, is still a young guy. Yeah. Um, it's just funny how time goes in sports. But, yeah, Austin Matthews. I mean, I, I don't think a whole lot has happened here yet. I mean, we, we've known that there's been some discussions, and I think everyone's comfortable, um, you know, with where things are going to go for him. You know, what's interesting is is Max Domi is represented by the same agent as, as Austin Matthews, Judd Moldaver. And so clearly the Leafs have been talking to Austin's camp, uh, albeit maybe not so much about Austin here of late. And, you know, I still think that this is a deal that goes into later in July. Maybe you get to August. You know, I'd be surprised if they didn't find a way to get something done, you know, well ahead of training camp. And really the focus seems to be on, a window of time between three and five years on this extension from, from the end of things. And, you know, I think the way some people look at this in a funny way, I mean, if Austin and Matthews and Leafs end up doing a three-year extension, I can anticipate that some people are going to freak out about that, but there are benefits for the Leafs if they do that. You know, I think if he signs a three-year extension, there's a chance it comes in under $13 million. And so, you know, that's not a guarantee, Look, right now, Nathan McKinnon is a high water mark in the NHL for, for yearly salary at $12.6 million. I'm confident Austin Matthews' next deal will be above that. But I think if it's a three-year deal, it becomes a more manageable number for the Leafs you know, to build a team around Austin Matthews in these next few years. He also has one more season on his contract. So really, a three-year deal signs him for four more years, and that, that basically takes up his, his 20-year-old seasons as, as a Maple Leaf. I mean, basically, he's given his best years you know, by what we see typically in, from hockey players to, to that organization. You know, if they go five years, obviously the number gets higher. You know, you, you're talking about something above 13 and a half million. I think then maybe even the 14, you know, and we'll see where things end up. But I think that that's kind of maybe the range you're looking at on a five-year contract. And so for Matthews, you know, that, that, that gives the Leafs a little bit, you know, it could be a difference of a million dollars there per year. That's a million less the Leafs can spend starting in the 24, 25 season. So, you know, that's, that's some of what they're, they're going to be looking at. Um, but I, I don't think that there's anything in terms of hard negotiations going on. I think the Leafs are sort of getting through this period and now they're getting towards it, right? I mean, they got to figure out Matt Murray. They've got to get Elias Sampson off sign and he might ultimately go to salary arbitration. Um, you know, I don't know that there's a whole lot else for them to do in terms of shopping on the free agent market. You know, I think the Nylander situation probably gets resolved before Matthews. Not not a guarantee, but I think that's how it's trending, and, and they've got to find a solution there. And then ultimately you get to Matthews, and, and I, I think that both sides have a good understanding of where the parameters are. And, you know, I, I'd be surprised if it was anything other than a three-, four-, or five-year deal that Austin Matthews ends up signing. Okay. Uh, one last thing before we get to sports interaction. I know we kind of touched off on the new free agents that joined the Leafs and the, the look of them. I just can't help but think of uh, Rachel Dory uh, going on Twitter and saying that uh, the uncles of Leafs Nation would very much like uh, the new players that they've signed. Uh, just can we elaborate a little bit more on on the fact that these players that they've added, in particular Bertuzzi, Reeves, and Domi, to a certain extent, 
they seem to add a little bit more bite, which maybe the Leafs have lacked in a few years. Maybe some of the people who are a little bit more analytically focused might not like those moves. I'm, I'm just kind of curious a little bit more about your vantage point on that. Well, I think with Bertuzzi and Domi in particular, this that doesn't need to be an analytics argument. I think they're pretty, pretty established, pretty quality players in the league. You know, they, they bring something more, you know, Bertuzzi in particular. Like, let's, let's really focus. I think Bertuzzi brings a real heavy forecheck. He's willing to take it to the opponents a little bit more. Very aggressive, high-energy player. Um, you know, and he, he could end up playing with, with Matthews and Marner. Or, you know, we'll see how where Sheldon Keefe ends up land. But he gives, he gives them an option. He's going to be playing for sure with some of the least most skilled players and brings that different element. I think Domi, certainly he will fight and lose his temper every once in a while, but I, I don't see him quite in the same vein. I don't see him instigating, you know, he's not, uh, this won't be Bruce Brothers necessarily. You know, and then Ryan Reeves, is he's a very unique player in the league. You know, no matter what you want to say about it, and obviously the contract is very long, uh, I would remind you that you can bury $1.1 million without penalty on the cap in, in the American Hockey League if things go poorly, if he... You know, if he doesn't age well, then then there's there's lots of escape hatches, I would say, for that contract for the Leafs. But he's he's one of one. I mean, he's he's the apex predator in the league, in my opinion. When you when you talk about fighting and and those sorts of aspects, he also can play a little bit for for players that that are known for you know for their more aggressive tendencies. And so that's why he keeps getting contracts. I mean, this guy's 36 years old, and you know, teams still want him. I know he's bounced around the league a fair bit. And, and I think the Leafs want him as much for the on ice as some of the off ice things that, that he might do in terms of holding people accountable in their locker room, being a bit of a character. I mean, I think that that's, it's still early days yet. Let's not go to get too carried away. But when you're starting to see the stamp Brad True Living's putting on the team, he's just going in a, a slightly different direction with the players around the Leafs core. I mean, look at the Leafs core players. With those players, they finished top five in the NHL each of the last three years in the regular season. And it hasn't worked in the playoffs for whatever reason you might want to ascribe to that. I, I think it's what's clear is that I still think that the Leafs will be a good team, but Brad True Living is trying to fill them out with some different, different elements. Maybe I don't know if it's going to be pure toughness or if it's just going to be maybe playing a little more assertively, um, maybe a little bit more confidence in the dressing room. I mean, we'll have to see how it works out. I mean, the Leafs also tried to re-sign Ryan O'Reilly, right? Uh, the Leafs, the Leafs would have given Ryan O'Reilly the exact same contract he took in Nashville, four years and four and a half million. He chose to leave. So you know, and I, and while Ryan O'Reilly, very gritty sort of guy, you know, I, it wasn't like they only targeted certain types of players. I think some of it is just what what was still available on the marketplace that could fill the needs they have. I mean, the Reeves signing is particularly it's sort of a culture signing. I think. I mean that 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 he had the ability to talk to teams before July first. The Leafs had that locked in verbally before July first. Um, clearly they prioritize what he does and I actually understand it. There's, there's not, there's not a second version of Ryan Reeves out there. I, I don't think, I think he's in his own way, a, a unicorn. Um, not everyone might appreciate the, the kind of game he plays or might not like fighting still in the sport. I mean, I, I can understand that, but it, it is still happening. He had seven fighting major, majors last year. And I do think it's, it's not just about the fighting, but kind of, I think everyone will know when they're in a room with Ryan Reeves, if you know what I'm saying. It's, it's just, he's, I think he's very confident. He's earned that confidence. And I think that, that, you know, the Leafs feel like their team has maybe just lacked a little bit of personality, maybe um, to some degree, or been a little too quiet, too much of the same thing, maybe. So Bradshaw Living's bringing in some different elements. I, I, it'll be interesting to see how it works. And, and, you know, I, I still think that there's still a few holes still to be painted in and see uh, exactly what the roster looks like for next year. I'm just looking forward to that eventual Leafs Bruins encounter where Revo and Milan Lucic go at it. That's what I'm looking forward to the most. Right. And honestly, I think part of this is driven by Arbor Jack guy too in Montreal. I mean, this division has it's not a sport that features a lot of fighting compared to where it was 10 years ago, but the Atlantic has some big boys in it now. And I think the Leafs wanted to be going into those games with the teams that they're going to have to compete with to qualify for the playoffs again, and then ultimately face in in the first round or second round of the playoffs that they want to have they want to show up with the right weapon so to speak and so i mean i i think it it will be popular here there's still a lot of fans in all cities i think that that like that side of the game and you know the leafs under kyle dubas that wasn't really too much a part of it i mean look he did acquire wayne simmons and kyle clifford i mean it's not not as though the leafs haven't ever had 
these types of players, but I, I just think Ryan Reeves is a totally different thing than those those two guys. He's he's there's there's not another one of him out there, at least not playing in the NHL. And that's gonna do it for Leafs Corner. We're gonna get to sports interaction, break down the rest of the hockey world's moving and shaking. And because it's Monday, we will get two questions for Ask CJ. You can bet that with David Bastel. Brought to you by Sports Interaction. Get in the action and make a play. 19 plus. Please play responsibly. Time for Sports Interactions. You can bet that. Sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN for all of your gaming needs. Uh, No immediate uh, hockey props and futures to tell you about. So here is uh, the projected uh, odds on favorite to win the World Series in baseball. We do happen to love baseball around here. Uh, Atlanta at plus 284, the betting favorite according to Sports Interaction. Tampa Bay with the second best odds. Los Angeles, third best odds. Any idea where Toronto might rank in all of this? 108th. <laughs> I'm pretty sure there are fewer than 108 teams in Major League Baseball. I so like the know. odds of some AAA and AA teams better than the Leafs or the Jays at this point. So. Uh, what if I told you they had the seventh best odds at 1920? I would tell you that the odds makers are much higher on their team than I am. I would say that. You know, I'm I'm just a fan, but uh, not not feeling awesome about this team this year. If I'm being honest, what's wrong with the with the Toronto Blue Jays? Why are they so inconsistent? What's up with John Schneider? What's up with the pitching? What's up with the hit? They have some all stars this year, but why are they not working? I don't know. I mean, Vladdy has been quiet by his standards. I know he's hit a few homers here lately. Um, so the stats are getting a little bit better for him. But, I mean, he didn't have a homer at Rogers Center for, like, the first half of the season almost. Um, I don't have a good answer for it, but all I know is I'm, I'm a little frustrated. Because let's face it, hockey season is now finally kind of coming to its merciful conclusion. Yes. I have time to really lock in on the Jays, you know, hopefully get down to some games. And I just want to see them in a playoff race. Because I, I, I can never really engage April, May, June. I'll, I'll catch the odd game here or there, but I, you know, with, with my work responsibilities, I can't really be following the team too closely. So I always just hope to get to July with them in the hunt. And I don't know, every time I see them play, I'm just underwhelmed. I'll put it that way. How many ballparks do you plan on visiting during the summer? At least one. <laughs> I'll be at Rogers center for a game, probably on a Tuesday night when it's dollar dog night. Um, mm. I don't know if I don't, I, w- I won't rule out going to another one. I went to a game in Minnesota this year, a, a Jays game. Uh, at Target Field was the first time I was there. Mm-hmm. But uh, so I'll probably hit another park. I just I don't have any nothing on the calendar just yet uh, in terms of trying to to get somewhere. But who knows if the team thinks I might be a little less inclined to, to travel and go watch them play somewhere else and get their ass kicked. I, I couldn't believe that. I'm planning on watching a Washington Nationals game at some point. I may or may not visit a friend in San Francisco. So that might mean a Giants game. And I I try to go to one Blue Jays game a year. So be on the lookout if I come to Toronto (laughs) at some point in the summer. And I'm like, hey, uh, I'm going to watch the Blue Jays against somebody. I don't know. I'd love that, man. Anyway, I I won't feel confident about them as the seventh best World Series odds. I'll tell you that much. Well, uh, if you do, they are at 1920 on uh, Sports Interactions website. The seventh best odds uh, to win the World Series. Uh, the teams above them, Atlanta, Tampa Bay, uh, Los Angeles. Uh, they don't specify. No, okay, they do specify is the Dodgers. Uh, Houston, Texas, and the New York Yankees. All those teams have better odds uh, than the Toronto Blue Jays at winning the World Series. And if you want to go check that out, you should check out sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN for all the best odds before game, in game, and the best props sportsinteraction.com slash sdpn this episode of the chris johnston show is brought to you by ag1 i drink it pretty much every day and i gave it a try because i was really tired of taking all these vitamins and pills going through all these different bottles and capsules and trying to just make sense of all of them why do i have to have five or six of these different things when i could have one one dose of ag1 put it in my water drink about eight ounces of it, and I get a whole bunch of different vitamins and minerals that help me on my day, whether I'm just sitting at my computer doing shows like the CJ show, or I'm going out with my teammates playing slow pitch softball. It's a good way to spend 
uh, my Mondays in particular, helps me feel unstoppable uh, when I take AG1. Uh, if a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash Johnston. That's drinkag1 slash Johnston. Siege, as we get out of Leafs Corner, what do you think about some of the other moves that went down this weekend? Guys like Dmitry Orlov signing in Carolina, Matt Duchesne being bought out, and then signing in Dallas. Uh, some of the other moves that have gone on this weekend. What did you think? Yeah, Carolina's an interesting team, aren't they? Like they're, yeah, they they're just see, they seem to be in on everything. Um, unafraid, I would say, by NHL standards to shake up their roster and you know, look at, at trading pieces and signing pieces. I mean, the Orlov deal, you know, I, I like it from his standpoint. I know we hit on it in the first segment, but, you know, he set himself up now to, to potentially get a big payday again. Um, you know, he's just seen, what, Radko Gudis at age 33. He got pretty big contract in Anaheim. He'll be about 33 in two years' time when this deal comes up. And then obviously making north of $7 million, um with Carolina. It's a good place to go and have a chance to win a Stanley Cup. The Hurricanes also brought in Michael Bunting. You know, I think scoring is always a question for Carolina, especially when it gets to the big moments. I mean, it's certainly one of the best regular season teams we've seen. You know, we'll probably get a little deeper on this later, but Carolina is one of the teams still trying to get Eric Carlson too. And they've got to settle things with Brett Pesci, um, you know, who's a player who's due for an extension a year from now and that the Hurricanes have kind of indicated they'd look at trading if they weren't able to sign him. And so a lot of moving pieces there. So I found them kind of a team of, of interest on the first day. You know, Pittsburgh Penguins under Kyle Dubas were, were pretty active too, um, doing a lot of different things. I mean, that's the other thing. Carolina both let Antti Ranta and Frederick Anderson briefly hit the open market and then kept their two goaltenders. And they also still have Pyotr Kachetkov, uh, part of their organization. So they're going with a three-headed monster again. Kachetkov doesn't need waivers next season. They've got one more year where they can have the luxury of having a, a top young goaltender, but but you know basically swing them between the AHL and NHL as they need. Um you know, in Pittsburgh, they let Tristan Jari hit the market. I think Frederick Anderson was a player they were looking at the Penguins as a potential plan B, but instead keep Tristan Jari. But he gets a big deal, right? Uh, north of $5 million on a five-year contract, you know, coming off a season where I think there were some questions about his play. Uh, you look at the big sample of games, He's he's been a pretty top-level goaltender in the NHL, but last year didn't go so well. Uh, and then they bring in a flurry of other guys, right? Nola Chari, Lars Eller. Don't have the list in front of me, but there's, you know, Kyle Dubas was pretty active there. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that all works because I, I think it's a tough job that Dubas has walked into in a sense. You know, the, the Penguins are trying to remain competitive with, you know, players at the top of their roster, you know, Hall of Famers, guys you build statues for, but you, you just don't know how much how much is left. I mean, I want to believe, as anyone does, that guys like Crosby and Melkin can play forever. Um, but the reality is that at some point, you know, I think that their production or their effectiveness will drop off. And so, you know, they've got this window where they're trying to win. And so, you know, I, I found it interesting how, how busy he was. I mean, I what else stood out to you? I, you know, it's a bit of a blur when you're you're living it on <laughs> set, man. Like, I had questions about that, too. I, was like, I, mm. I have questions about that, too. And we'll get to that and ask CJ, too, because it's one thing to go through that on set. Uh, of, of course, you were part of TSN's coverage for Free Agent Frenzy, but also on a day where Twitter had that rate limit problem going on. Like, I, I wonder how you were dealing with that. It was annoying because it was hard to – the hardest part was I, – I, first of all, I didn't know if how many or if all my tweets got out. I couldn't tell if they were, like, being sent. And then secondly, the issue is it was hard to keep track of what everyone else was tweeting or saying because, you know, at any given moment, it, it would stop working. Uh, <laughs> So that was that was kind of weird. I'll say this. I, I, I was a proponent of I liked the having the entry draft and the, the free agent period all rammed together. Yeah. Like I think in some ways it's just like nice to hammer through it. But the experience of living it was freaking like I'm still exhausted, man. Like I just feel between you know, being in Nashville for four days covering the draft and everything that goes on there, you fly home one day on, on Friday. And in, in the studio all day Saturday, obviously doing my other duties, writing and, and, and the like, like I just, I'm, I'm mentally spent at this point in time. A lot of, I've had a lot of screen time. I wouldn't want to look at that number that the, the phone logs just from just staring and texting everyone like this. Yeah. You're just like, like on screen, like holding the phone. How did like you I'm get ready? out of Nashville, by the way? No problems. 
it's funny. I think I was one of the lucky ones. Our, our flight went as scheduled, but, you know, still got home Friday night at like 6 p.m. You know, obviously we're, we're you know, very much in touch with what's going on and then wake up first thing and got the run done, but then went to the studio. So it was just, it just was a lot pushed together. I don't think next year will be quite so, so I think there'll be a little bit more breathing room between the draft and uh, free agency. And I'm grateful now that it's over, but I'm I'm ready to curl up in a ball and disappear. Oh my God. I feel like you need a hug. <laughs> no, I don't, sorry. I don't, want, I don't want to say it too badly, but it's, it's, it's tiring, man. It's a long ass year um, and a lot, and a yeah. lot of, demands i mean we love what we do but you get to july 3rd now it's just like all right enough hockey for a little while Come on, man. we um, all need two, to recharge the batteries you definitely do two teams i want to bring up here uh the nashville predators and the fact that uh, barry trotz uh seems to be trying to put some kind of winning stamp on the team it's pretty much highlighted by uh, the signing of, of ryan o'reilly what I, we can talk a little bit more about ryan o'reilly as well of course uh played some games with the Toronto Maple Leafs. It seemed as if at first he wasn't going to come back. Then there was a window of opportunity that he could come back. And then that door got, got cut shut. Like, let's kind of talk a little bit about Ryan O'Reilly and also the fact that the Predators were able to get him. Well, I mean, what a interesting couple weeks for Nashville. I mean, not only are you transitioning away from the only GM and David Paul you've ever had in your existence to Barry Trotz, but they just made some earth moving moves there or shattering moves, right? Like they traded Ryan Johansson to Colorado for nothing, but the cap space, uh, they buy out Matt Duchesne. I think my, the, the word I got on that one is it was surprising, but not shocking. Like it's not, I don't know if anyone was predicting that, but I think like the, they clearly want to change the culture around that team. Um, you know, you bring in Luke Shen, uh, on, on the blue line on a contract. I mean, what a, what a home run for Luke Shen. He's going to make $2.75 million next season. That's more than he made each of the last three seasons put together, and he's 33. And he got a three-year deal, so he's got that next year, the year after, and the year after that. Um, but obviously, that's a, a culture-type signing. I mean, he's still an effective player, um, but, you know, pretty pretty big money for, for Luke. Um, and then you get Ryan O'Reilly, too. And so they're, they're trying to turn some things over. I mean, the Predators, too, Julian, were very aggressive at the draft. Um, you know, Barry Trotz put the, their goaltender prospect Askarov in play at the draft, was trying very badly to move into the top four because he, he really wanted to get one of the centers available. Um, believe he also talked about getting the fifth pick from Montreal. Uh, ultimately, it's very strange when I mean, we haven't spoken since then. We didn't see one trade on the first day of the draft. Like that, that that's unheard of, not even a pick trade, let alone one involving a player. Um, but, you know, it's clear – making this change at the top of the organization, they, they really want to change the organization. They want to, to turn things over. I think they want to become more offensive. You know, they were in on Bertuzzi too. I know that they were trying to get him before he went to Toronto. Um, they, they've still got a fair amount of cap space. So I, I think they're still an interesting team to watch. And, and, you know, it might end up being by trade now because we're, we're kind of down to, um, you know, we're getting into the clearance rack now of, of NHL free agency, I'd say, even on day three. Um, but, you know, the, the Predators are, are clearly taking a longer range view. They made a ton of draft picks at the draft because they, they, they made some trades at the deadline. And I think that they, they want to be a different organization than they've been. And, and they've been one of the more steady teams, right? You knew what they were. It's probably because of that continuity. They've had like four coaches in their history and now two GMs, like for 25 years. I mean, it's unheard of to, to have that little, that much stability. And so they've made this change. We'll see. And, you know, when you mentioned O'Reilly. I mean, I never thought he wanted to come back to Toronto. Like, like I was there when he had his locker cleanout day after the Leafs lost to, to Florida. And he was already speaking in past tense. Like, he was, you know, I just felt he was very frank. Like, he was like, it was a great opportunity to come and play for an organization like the Leafs, play close to home, to live that, experience it. But it never felt to me like he wanted to come back. I think where the stories picked up leading into July 1st is, you know, Brad Tree living after he took over for Kyle Dubas wanted to bring him back and made an effort to bring him back and, and was willing to pay him basically what he got paid in Nashville. It's just, you know, Riley's probably got his reasons. Of course, I don't know what they are, but, but he didn't want to come back to the Leafs. Like I think that that's at the end of the day, that's what happened there. You know, some, someone like Shen, it's more clear cut. I mean, he gets that, that contract from the predators, the Leafs say, congratulations, Luke, you've been a great, you know, you did a great job for us, and we just can't pay you that. They can't in their cap world. You know, with O'Reilly, it's more of it's 
more apparent that this was a, a person personal choice for Ryan and his family uh, to to go play in Nashville rather than, than stay on in Toronto. Okay. What about the other team I'm thinking of, the Boston Bruins? Uh, we did mention that Dmitry Orlov, no longer a member of the organization. We did mention Milan Lucic joining that team in the offseason as well. Uh, but they've also made some changes beyond that as well. Remember a couple of days ago, they traded away Taylor Hall. Uh, Tyler Pertuzzi, no longer a member of that organization. What are they going to do on the wing and what else can they do? I know they're, they don't necessarily have the most cap space to play with. No, I mean, they, they also bought out Mike Riley uh, before the first buyout window closed and, and, you know, traded away Taylor Hall for just the cap space, you know, not for a, re- a return that's going to help them in the short term, plus Nick Foligno, who they weren't going to resign. Um, you know, I, they're an interesting team. It, to me, it all still hinges on what happens with Patrice Bergeron and David Krejci. I mean, those were their top two centers last year. Bergeron just picked up another Selkie just because that's, that's what he does. It's like, is this guy really going to retire after winning the last two Selkie trophies? It just seems wild. I mean, obviously he's got a family to consider and his own health and he's been doing this a long time, but he's still playing at a level that I think it, it, it makes or breaks what the Bruins are. Um, they've tried to insulate themselves from whatever happens with those decisions. You know, they get James Van Riemsdyk on a good value deal, $1 million. I mean, not, not any risk built into that for them, but would obviously be looking to have him play net front at the power play, might maybe power play too, depending on how they line things up, but to, to cash in some goals for them. Um, you know, they got Morgan Geeky, who kind of shook free surprisingly when, when the Seattle Kraken chose not to, to give him a qualifying offer, you know, which was, I would say that was a surprising move. I mean, Morgan Geeky is someone that they got in the expansion draft. Uh, they did attempt to trade him over the weekend at the draft and weren't able to, but then ultimately just let him walk for free. Um, you know, I didn't, did not see that one coming, but pretty good young player to slot in. It's like your third line center or whatnot, um, for the Bruins. So, you know, Boston, I think is going to be competitive, but it's, it's such a different team. I mean, just, it's hard to know, like last year was such a surprise. I'd say that they were that dominant, you know, really probably the best regular season in NHL history, arguably, or certainly among them. Um, I, I'm not predicting a precipitous fall off, but I just, I don't know where they go from here. Uh, and with the big question marks still being down the middle, um, you know, on the Milan Lucic signing, I mean, that's, that's kind of a nice, you know, full circle moment, right? He, he was a prototypical Boston Bruin in his prime, you know, jump right from junior into the, their lineup and, you know, help propel that team to Stanley cup in 2011 and a lot of other success uh, elsewhere. And so nice for him to, to get a chance to go back there. And, and, you know, I, I, that one made sense to me even at the trade deadline. I mean, I think the biggest issue was, you know, the, the cap hit that he carried. But, um, you know, I think Lucic will, you know, he's going to spice it up that, that Atlantic division we're talking about. There's there's a lot of, lot, lot of big fellas roaming around the Atlantic these days. And before we get to questions, Eric Carlson, what's the latest on him? Well, they're trying to move him. And, and you know, I, I think at this point in time, the push has to be now to get it done. You know, where exactly it stands is hard to read. I, I know at some point here in the last few days, um, the Sharks have given teams the ability to speak directly to Eric Carlson. You know, that's important because he has a no movement clause. Obviously, ultimately, he's going to dictate where he goes to the extent that, he, you know, he can say no if he doesn't want to go somewhere. Um, you know, I think the Leafs had a conversation there. It doesn't sound like doesn't sound like they were a prime target for him or maybe even just the fit with the, the money and everything was going to be too difficult or onerous. I think Carolina is a, a real team to keep an eye on in the Carlson sweepstakes. You know, the Pittsburgh Penguins um, have inquired on Carlson, which I think is quite interesting for one because they have Chris Letang there already. And so there, there is some sort of overlap of skill sets, um, but also because that would be a big stamp, big, big move for Kyle Dubas after taking that job, if he could make it happen. I think Seattle's another team maybe to keep an eye on when it comes to Carlson. But, you know, when you when you break it down, the field is relatively limited just because of the $11.5 million cap hit, you know, and, you know, the assets it's going to take to get them. I, I think that the Sharks, we've seen so many trades in the last week or two where literally players that are still useful are just being given away uh, for the, the cap space, you know, and, and I think the Sharks still view – Eric Carlson is an asset, even though he carries a considerable cap hit. And so I don't know how they kind of how that will get rectified or, or solved. But um, yeah, I think that's that's kind of where it's at. Teams are speaking with Carlson. Mike Greer is talking to those those general managers with those teams. And, you know, I think that everyone understands, though, this is the time to move them. And, and you know, I think Eric really wants a chance to, 
to win the Stanley Cup. And so that's not coming in San Jose. And in, in the time, he's still going to be an effective NHL player. And so maybe it's in one of Pittsburgh, Carolina, or Seattle that we see him skating next year. Oh, I, this also slipped my mind as well. But anything we should look out for in terms of some of the other available free agents, uh, Patrick Kane, Vladimir Tarasenko, among those names that come to mind. Patrick Kane, don't expect anything in, in the near term here. He's still rehabbing after happening the, the, the hip procedure he had in June. And so I think that he just wants to focus on that rehabilitation, get healthy, survey the landscape, see who's interested, and then make a call later in the summer or as the season approaches. I mean, keep in mind too, Julian, I, I don't think we'll see him on the ice until November, maybe December in terms of uh, you know playing again in the NHL. So I think there's, there's time to work with in, in his case. You know, Tarasenko, as we're recording this, is probably the biggest name left on the board and, and maybe arguably the best player. I mean, you, you still have, you know, Sunkvist, you have Tatar, and some other players that I think will be useful members of whatever organization they join. But, you know, Tarasenko's a big weapon. You know, we, he's seen his, his production diminish, and so that's probably influenced the market. I, I think Carolina actually was one of the teams that had been in on him. Um, you know, Ottawa – had expressed interest in him. Um, you know, I think that would probably be tied if they're able to, to make an Alex Dabrinka trade, which is the other one we didn't talk about. Um, you know, the Senators did have a fair amount of discussion around the draft on Dabrinka, um with with teams. But, you know, he's, he's going to carry a fairly big price on the other side of, in terms of the extension that he signs on the other side of that trade. And so, while I'm sure all the teams had an ability to look at him like the player, two-time 40-goal scorer, never missed a game, Julian, actually. People talk about his size or, you know, he's never missed a game in the NHL um, due to an injury. I, I think he got COVID during one of the years and missed a, a small handful of games for, for Chicago. But other than that, he's played every game he's, he's been able to. And so he's, he's actually quite durable despite not being physically that, that large in stature. Um, but, you know, I think that, that those are the kind of teams to keep an eye on. And maybe there's a wild card out there for us somewhere, Anaheim or something like that. Okay. Let's get to ask CJ. Uh, let's take some questions from Discord. Uh, one from Maddie B. For CJ, is it simpler covering the free agent day July 1 or the NHL draft? Uh, also, nice seeing Julian at Sidebar. There was the fun little event they had in Nashville uh, with uh, Adam, Steve, Jesse, and the rest of the SDP crew. Um, I don't know what's easier. I think it's easier covering the draft in some senses because – you're seeing so many people face to face and as much as we all, you know, let's face it, I do 90% of my job through calls and texts. It nothing quite matches being able to, to look someone in the eye and have a discussion. And I think get information quickly. Um, and, but free agency isn't that hard really, because especially when you go to the draft, you get a sense of where a lot of the big situations sit. And, and, you know, I think that, you know, it's also the start of summer vacation kind of thing. So it's pretty exciting to get to July 1st. It's like a great vibe. Like you should have saw the TSM parking lot when we were done. It was like the Indy 500. Like just <laughs> just cars racing out of there. Like I know some of them were headed directly for cottage country. Um, but, you know, it's just such a long year, as I mentioned. Like everyone gets so excited to get to that day and, and pound through it. So, you know, both are fun events. Um, I, I will say this free agent frenzy is a lot less stressful than the trade deadline. Like the trade deadline, I don't know why it is, maybe because of where it falls or there's more moving pieces. Um, the trade deadline is far, I feel, usually feel far more stress going through that than when we get to July 1st. Okay. What about from Artemi, also on Discord? Will you, CJ and Julian, still be using Twitter as professional reporters with relationships to multiple media organizations? How does that kind of thing get decided? I haven't discussed it with anyone. I, I, there's, I don't see any reason why I wouldn't continue to use Twitter. I like Twitter. I think it's been a huge tool. I think it's, it's really helped our profession and been uh, a positive for us. So like, I, I guess I don't, I don't know enough of what's going on. Like, I don't know if that was just, was that just one day where things went down? Is this the future? I guess as long as it functions reasonably well, I plan to keep using it. Um, I know it might be kind of controversial, but I actually pay for the blue service mostly because I was finding I was getting too many people putting information out like that was discrediting me a little bit that like 
I know it's it's hard to still prove you're verified because someone else, if they wanted to, could pay for an account and put their name as mine and take the picture, but that's far more work, right? And so I ended up paying for Twitter Blue just really because I'm worried about, you know, I feel like credibility and reputation is a big part of what we do. And, and there's a lot of shit on there, man. I don't know if you noticed. It's just like a lot of stuff that I never said that people are pretending to be me, a lot of copycats. So I, I just, I bit the bullet and did that. The one benefit, honestly, is I've been able to use the edit button a couple times when I oh, okay. get when I get these chubby fingers all smashing the buttons and misspelling people's names by accident in the rush to get information out. So that's a benefit. So yeah, the, the long story is I do plan on keep using Twitter as long as Twitter exists. I I just I don't know what the future of the company is. Same deal for me. I don't plan on uh, buying uh, verification from Twitter. That's just my personal thing. I just am not interested in doing it. I don't have the same concerns as siege with regards to someone you know trying to create a fake account uh i will say uh, i started a, a profile on blue sky which is supposed to be an alternative to twitter uh i believe spill also exists which is also supposed to be the same thing i don't know if people remember mastodon a couple of months ago they were trying to do the same thing i, I don't know if they're going to get a lot of people out of this it seems like blue sky might be uh, the move but yeah as long as twitter reasonably works i'll still kind of lurk around but i have seen a few of my uh group chats uh for a couple of projects that i do uh, already move from twitter to uh to like whatsapp as an example so the truth yeah, i can i can start see a migration the truth is though is it's hard to recreate the network effects i mean twitter twitter yeah. everyone's on twitter that would want it like it's hard. Like, how do we know, how does everyone automatically decide to go to one of those platforms or the other? Like, I, I just feel, I, I feel like Twitter will still be, still be the spot. Yeah. Like Twitter, like just the interface, the, the way it's supposed to work, like it, people have just kind of made themselves uh, their names on Twitter anyway. Like people are just going to stick, people are going to stick on that website until it dies essentially. But you're I'll be, absolutely I'll right. be there to yeah. turn out the lights, man. Oh, me too. But also like, you're right. Like how do people know where to go like i saw i saw the info for spill and people are describing it as like that's like the black twitter spot like that's where like these black creators like made it that's where all the funny meat that like let's be real twitter great place for news amazing place for memes and i love the idea of having a separate place for that but like i didn't know that was a thing until after i joined blue sky social so like it's a lot for a lot of people as far as i'm concerned let me know what the next one is if we get there. Yeah, if I get an invite code for one of those sites, I'll uh, I'll swing it over. That's another thing, too. It's not even like you could just join these sites. You basically just have to hope you're friends with some famous person who's generous enough to give you an invite code to join these sites because there's testing in beta. I guess that's how you create the network effect. You make it so people are in demand and they're asking and they're spreading. Anyway, but anyway. Uh, that's going to do it for the Monday edition of the CJ show, uh, in the post free agency draft glow, uh, as we do wind ourselves down for, uh, summertime and relaxation, which I know I'm looking forward to. And I know CJ, you're very much looking forward to that. Yeah, man. I mean, we, I think we'll still put out a couple more episodes. We'll see how it goes here. Maybe we talk about something other than hockey. We'll see what happens. Maybe, I would maybe love that. Maybe there's a big Carlson trade. I mean, there's things, there's still, there's still things percolating. I can tell you today, just texting around the league, you know, a lot of people still at work in NHL front offices. It's not, not like the gone fishing signs have been hung up and, you know, some of that's development camps and the like, but I still think that there's still going to be some action. Soon as uh, we get some of that big news, if we can get to it, we will get to it. Subscribe to the podcast, whether on Apple, Spotify, or whatever podcast carrier you have. Uh, subscribe to the SDPN YouTube channel as well. Subscribe to the SDPN Discord as well. For CJ, I'm Julian. So long and peace. The Chris Johnston Show. Powered by Sports Interaction. Wanna bet? Inside the game, twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter at Reporter Chris. And follow Julian McKenzie at JK McKenzie. The Chris Johnston Show.